Spinosaurs are always a great topic to bring up. They are always in the news, always unique, and always tragically mysterious. It stands to reason they should have some wacky brains, right? After millions of years of evolving into semi-aquatic fish eaters, they should have the networking in their noggins that proves this, right? A team of paleontologists digitally sliced open the skulls of a few of the English ones, and what they found was shocking. The Spinosauridae are an outlier group of long-snooted, chunky-bodied theropod dinosaurs with notably well-represented individuals from European, Asian, African, and South American fossil records. They are mainly restricted to early to mid-Cretaceous deposits with some early late Cretaceous material. However, research on the phylogeny of this group suggests that it originated in the Jurassic period, despite the fact that conclusive fossil evidence from this period is unknown. The Spinosauridae family is commonly split into two subfamilies, Spinosaurinae and Baryonychinae. All Spinosaurids that have been discovered so far exhibit bizarre skull and dental traits. They got wacky toofers and messed up Laffy Taffy skulls. The most noticeable and notable of these features is the extraordinarily long, slender croc snoot. Though I think they look a lot more like fish eating birds, gharials, or freshwater dolphins. None of them are as wide and robust as crocs and gators. Multiple lines of evidence indicate that these spiny dinos had peculiar semi-aquatic ecologies or niches in comparison to theropod taxa more closely related to them, including a very involved degree of piscivory or fish eating. A diverse variety of terrestrial and aquatic animals were most likely consumed as part of a generalist foraging strategy with individual size or environment perhaps determining what they chose to eat and what items were available to eat. This is remarkably similar to the bears of today, though I personally don't quite like jumping to that direct of a comparison yet. Despite the clear link between the Spinosaur morphology and a piscivorous habit, many of their remains have been discovered in what were formerly arid or semi-arid areas, with direct evidence of small dinos, pterosaurs, and fish in their stomachs. Though the Spinosaurian branch of the Spinosaurid tree may have had more semi-aquatic adaptations than the Baryonychine branch, the extent to which these adaptations were reflected in their behavior and ecology remains a hotly debated issue of considerable investigation. Like, it's really only hot among you normie weirdos that play sides with a dinosaur. Rest of us usually don't care which part of the debate turns out to be true. Anyway, I personally believe that if there is evidence of specialized semi-aquatic activity in Spinosaurids' skulls, stomachs, and where they are located, it stands to reason that their noggins should also have this degree of specializations. Endocasts, or castings of the brain from the brain case, are currently known from a wide variety of dinosaurs, most notably a wide variety of theropod dinosaurs, but not from Spinosaurs. What better group of Spinosaurs to study than the English Baryonychine Spinosaurs, who have the best preserved bones, and can be most securely linked to bodies of water and a semi-aquatic lifestyle. Dr. Darren Nash and a group of his colleagues, principally from the University of Southampton, released their first descriptive report on the new British Spinosaur dinosaurs Ceratosuchops inferodios and Riparovenator milnerae in 2021. Chris Barker headed the 2021 investigation, and his examination of the two animals represented the core of his PhD work. Ceratosuchops and Riparovenator are both from the Isle of Wight's Lower Cretaceous Wessex Formation, a rock formation that is part of the famed and notoriously complex Weldon Supergroup. Both of these long-snouted dinosaurs existed about 127 million years ago, give or take, in the Barremian period of the early Cretaceous. 
neither are complete, nor are they even near, yet they both include well-preserved parts of skeletal structure. Both had three-dimensional and well-preserved brain cases, as does the related Baryonyx walkeri from the upper weld clay formation of the English mainland. All three are members of the Spinosaurid family Baryonychinae. There has been a slew of Spinosaurid fossil material from the Weldon supergroup in recent years, with the 2021 paper being a great example, and the bits of a gigantic but fragmentary Spinosaurid being another. And now, a new paper that was just published in the Journal of Anatomy by Chris Barker, Darren Nash, Jacob Trend, Lysanne Mitchells, Lawrence Whitmer, Ryan Ridgely, Katie Rankin, Claire Clarkin, Philip Schneider, and Neil Gosling, that sees this team cut open the skulls of these heavy-clawed Baryonychines spinosaurs to take a gander at their brains and see what this means for their evolution and neurology. They began by CT scanning some Baryonychines. Anyone interested in the scientific study of prehistoric dinosaurs is aware of the revolution brought about by computed tomography technology. Scientists interested in the biology, behavior, function, and evolution of ancient creatures may now frequently put fossils in CT scanners and evaluate the findings thanks to developments in CT scanning technology and the availability of CT scanners themselves. Dr. Larry Whitmer and his lab are two well-known instances. Dr. Nash and his colleagues were especially fortunate to have access to the University of Southampton's massive walk-in machine at the Micro-VIS X-ray Imaging Center. Fossils are usually made up of more than one mineral. The nature and density of the sediment that often surrounds and infills the fossils impairs the scanner's capacity to pick up fossil bone. This is particularly important for Weldon fossils, since some of these sediments include minerals that interfere with straightforward scanning attempts. This specifically affects one of the two Isle of Wight Spinosaurids. The Riparovenator specimen is densely packed with radio-opaque material, rendering it impenetrable for this kind of investigation. That's too bad, but how about the others? This was not true for all Weldon Spinosaurid specimens. The scientists scanned the Ceratosuchops holotype in Southampton and the Baryonyx holotype in Ohio Health Oblenus Hospital in Athens, Ohio. And the study's main uniqueness is that it offers the first CT scan data for Baryonychines ever published. Both skulls provide positive findings, and it was assumed that the useful data on brain architecture disclosed would be useful in terms of Baryonychine biology and lifestyle. Of course, they aren't the first Spinosaurids to be CT scanned, but they are the first Baryonychines. This picture depicts Baryonyx's brain in situ within the brain case. Baryonychine brain cases are narrow and deep, with basi-pteragoid structures that extend far below the remainder of the structure. The part of the brain shown here, without the olfactory bulbs and tract, is about 12.8 centimeters long. Good, everything is scanned. The scientists then compared the Baryonychine's brains to those of other theropods. What do the scans indicate about the brains of Baryonychines in comparison to those of other similar theropods, including one additional Spinosaurid and members of the more distantly related Megalosaurids and Allosauroids have at least some brain data? Oh, and uh, despite its apparent distinctions, Megalosaurids and Spinosaurids are close relatives within the theropod family Titanurae, with both composing the clade Megalosauroidea. There is debate about whether allosauroids are more closely related to birds than megalosauroids or if a clade of megalosauroids plus allosauroids exists. Darren has created an extremely simplified version of the first of two competing theropod cladograms. This tree depicts the more conventional topology in which allosauroids are more closely related to saurosaurs than megalosaurs. And here is a tree discovered in certain investigations, in which megalosauroids and allosauroids form a clade. What did they find? In terms of general shape and size, baryonychine brains are typical of theropods of this kind. Yeah, they're normal. Nothing crazy, really. 
The forebrain and hindbrain are parallel in the horizontal plane, and an elongate, narrow olfactory tract projects forwards to the olfactory bulbs. The optic lobes are difficult to distinguish from the rest of the forebrain. The flocular lobes are present as projecting tabs surrounded by the inner ear's semicircular canals, and the cranial nerves are in the expected position. Both creatures' brain cases are pneumatic, although not to the same extent as celurosaurs. Pneumatic meaning that they contain many hollow spaces within and without. Ceratosuchops and Baryonyx brains vary in various ways. Ceratosuchops has a midline groove along its upper surface. The two differ in terms of the position and extent of the peaked section at the top of the cerebrum. It's less prominent and located a bit further back in Ceratosuchops. The Ceratosuchops forebrain is inclined downwards, whereas that of Baryonyx is more horizontal. The Baryonyx inner ear is proportionally larger than that of Ceratosuchops, and both differ in the shape of the lateral semicircular canal. Why are they so conservative? Why aren't they funky? Overall, their brains aren't that dissimilar to those of other giant titanian theropods. If anything, baryonychine brains look anatomically conservative, at least in comparison to their skull's bony morphology. That's a surprise finding given that the alteration and specialization of the spinosaurid skull, particularly the sniffer, could lead you to assume a changed brain as well. These findings may be interpreted in a variety of ways. One explanation is that brain development lagged after the evolution of the bony elements of the skull, either because brains and nervous systems are slow to evolve, or conservative in general, or because the ancestral morphology was good enough and no further alteration was required. Another option is that theropods related to megalosaurids already have the sensory and somatosensory abilities essential for a successful baryonychine lifestyle. In other words, megalosauroids were pre-adapted for aquatic predation and an amphibious existence, and all they needed to do was change their snout, jaws, and teeth to become proficient at it. Some researchers have historically hypothesized that Torvosaurus may be a fish eater as well, and that was a megalosaur. And considering the highly sensitive snout of Neovenator, I would not be entirely surprised if it turned out that megalosaurs also had sensitive snouts and that this may have been one of those traits that made them pre-adapted for evolving into sensitive fish eaters. Other possibilities are plausible though. A third hypothesis is that adaptations have occurred, but they affect specifics of brain anatomy that cannot be determined using CT scan data. A fourth option is that baryonychines did not need specialized brains in comparison to other theropods because all the discussion about them being heron-like waders is exaggerated. Perhaps they were ecological generalists, preying on a variety of aquatic and terrestrial species and foraging similarly to megalosaurids and the like. That idea, however, does a terrible job of explaining why their skulls are otherwise so changed, so it's not particularly convincing. If they were generalists, why aren't all theropods they coexisted with long-snouted with crocodile-like teeth? It was previously stated that there is brain data from another spinosaurid. Marco Shade and colleagues published CT scan data from the brain of Irritator, a South American spinosaurian spinosaurid, in 2020. One feature that distinguishes it from baryonychines and other similar theropods is a bigger flocular lobe. Because the flocular lobe is important for gaze stability via synchronization of head, eye, and neck movement, Irritator's big lobes might indicate a specialty for water predation. The more typical flocular lobe of baryonychines, on the other hand, might indicate that they were less specialized or non-specialized for aquatic predation. With another caveat, there is considerable debate over how accurate a guide flocular lobe is for ecology and behavior. As the study shows, the researchers did about all they could with the data they gathered. The encephalization quotient, hearing range, olfactory acuity, and probable head posture were all estimated. They calculated the relative encephalization quotient of the sampled baryonychines by comparing estimated brain size to body size, and it ranges between 1.2 and 1.6. 
This is in the same ballpark as theropods like Carnotaurus and Allosaurus, suggesting that these creatures had comparable cognitive capacity and behavioral complexity. Hypotheses on smarts is outside the scope of this video or the paper. Ceratosuchops and Baryonyx seem to have had mean hearing frequencies in the 1400 to 1600 hertz range, based on cochlear duct size relative to basicranial length. That puts it roughly in the crocodilian range, but also, for those who believed this is crucial, in the range of many birds. There has been some speculation that Spinosaurids had decreased olfactory bulbs, and so a diminished sense of smell. However, this does not seem to be the case with Baryonychines. Their olfactory lobes are typical for theropods of their size, and their sense of smell was probably pretty excellent, akin to Abelosaurids and Allosaurus. Finally, the form of the condyle at the rear of the skull, as well as the direction of the semicircular canals, suggest that Baryonychines were standard theropods. There's no evidence that they kept the skull at a dipped down angle or anything, as has been suggested with Irritator. Overall, the findings show that Baryonychines did not depart much from normal, non salurosaurian theropod cognitive auditory capacities or olfactory capacities. Strange and intriguing. Strange for not being all that strange. And at this point, it pretty much sums up everything we're saying. Obtaining CT data on brain anatomy, paleoneurological data, from Baryonychine spinosaurids is a huge accomplishment, and applying it to infer sensory capacities and other things is also a worthwhile endeavor. The discovery that Baryonychines seem shockingly typical in comparison to non-spinosaurid theropods is an intriguing conclusion, but as information grows, so will our grasp of what this implies. Dr. Nash states that there is much more research on Weldon Spinosaurids in the work, so stay tuned for that. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my elephant tier patrons Arda Bayer, Biotiverse, Christoph Hubbinger, Dinosaur, Isaiah Garza, PA Brew News, Ray, Rudy Redgrave, Smiling Walrus. And another thanks to my Tyrannosaurus tier patrons Iberospinus, Iron Bladesman, Swaffles is Weird, Teeny Dragator, The Dogman, 